It is October 9th, 2013. My name is David Quick. I am interviewing Sally Madden for the DC Gardeners Oral History Project, which is a project of the Neighborhood Farm Initiative and the DC Humanities Council. Sally, thank you for sitting and talking with me. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, could we start by just having you say your name and your address? My name is Sally Madden. I live at 7100 Cedar Ave, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Thanks. And like I said, we're going to talk a lot about uh, your life in D.C. and experiences you've had as a gardener, but let's start by talking about your early life, where you grew up, family, neighborhood, things like that. I grew up in Waltham, Massachusetts, at which time Waltham was a blue-collar town. It had Brandeis, where my girlfriend and I used to go to study when we were in high school, but it was pretty much a blue-collar town, which it isn't anymore. And my parents were immigrants, my father from Ireland and my mother from originally France and Quebec. Mm -hmm. And um, they had not gone to school. My, my uh, father had begun, but his mother had cancer, and so he quit. So my early upbringing was at a time where there was a lot of emphasis on going to school and you know, that school was a way to move up in the world. But we had we lived in a tiny little house, and he had a garden in the back. Your father? Yes. And he would grow tomatoes. And in New England, that's a big deal, because mm -hmm. you've got to get right in there. But I have memories of a child going out there. He'd go out, and he'd pick one warm and eat it with salt. And that was my introduction. He had that garden. I think he had a little bit of rhubarb, but not much else, because it was so cold. But... That was really my introduction. It felt to me, I guess, when I look back on it, that that was just what people did. You know, they mm -hmm. grew their own food. And, and my grandmother, who was my mother's mother, lived with us. And she made lace, she made clothes, she canned, she cooked, she did everything. And she looked at me and said, I'm not teaching you anything because you're going to go to school, hmm. which I resented, although I cook like she does, which is you look and see what you got and you make something mm -hmm. like my recipe. And she was from she France was, or from Quebec? She was from Quebec. Okay. She was one of 13 children mm -hmm. from Quebec. And at that time, uh, when I was in middle school, what they call middle school now, Boston was very involved in the issue with Sputnik because mm -hmm. MIT and Harvard were very involved in the engineering part of it. And when Sputnik went up, I was, I think, 9 or 10 and they made a decision, the universities, to develop a science program for the public schools. And um, I was in their advanced placement engineering program. And there were two, one was college bound, one was their engineering. So it was me and 29 guys. But they were really, it was really interesting because one of the things they did was in the summers, they would put each one of us with a scientist and my junior year, I went out to the Navy Quartermaster Corps in Natick, Mass. And I spent the summer with a scientist who was studying how the brain processes coding. He also was a jazz musician. He had an anechoic chamber and he used to play jazz. But as a result of that, I did, ran a, a study and published it when I was, well, when was that? I think it was in, I was 16. And I was a finalist in the Westinghouse Science Talent, which no girls ever were. Mm -hmm. But it was wonderful. And when I look back on it, they did a study about 15 years ago. 87% of the people that were in that have PhDs in science at this point. In the high school program you yeah. were in? I see. Hmm. Throughout the greater Boston. So what they did really made a difference. Mm -hmm. And yet it was never repeated. But for me... It was a, a step into, um, you know, really wanting to go to college and to, you know, think about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So um, my parents didn't know how to go to college. So they, yeah. What kind of work did your parents do? My father was in the insurance industry, which was unusual for Irish because it was mostly Brahmin, but he was one as an inspector who would go out and inspect certain claims. Yeah. And my mother was a, a, like an assistant nurse. She worked in the hospital. My first job was making baby formula in the hospital. Hmm. Yeah. And, and when you say Brahmin, you mean kind of New England elite yeah. kind of thing? Okay. Yeah. 
yeah. yeah. My father tells of when he was a child, uh, well, not such a small child, but the Ku Klux Klan would burn crosses in the Irish backyard in Boston, which I had not heard of. Hmm. So there was a lot of prejudice at that time. What so, brought him to the U.S.? There were seven brothers, and we think in, initially it was the end of the potato famine. Mm-hmm. And they all came at different times and settled around Boston and got involved working on the railroads, which the Irish did. One brother went back, and my father was, you know, part of that, and they stayed close together, um, and they pretty much remained in the Boston area. None of them went anyplace else. The one that went back, I brought my father back when I graduated. uh, No. When I did my finish my PhD, I brought him back to Ireland to go to where this young fellow returned and and his brother, his, yeah, 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 which was kind of neat. We're from an area called Spittle, which is outside of Galway, uh-huh. and we're what's known as the Black Irish. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, mm-hmm. but they're the Sephardic Jews that left Spain and settled in that area. So we have mm-hmm. brown eyes and olive skin, and so it's really neat. So those Spaniards, who are the uh, the forebears of the Black Irish, were Jews. Yeah, they were Sephardic Jews. Oh, I didn't know that. And when you go into the old Galway, there's a, a lot of Hebrew carved in the stones. And at the time I went back, the mayor of Galway was Jewish. Hmm. Did they retain their their religion, their Judaism? No. Or? Yeah. No, no, they did not. Mm-hmm. But they did retain their culture for mm-hmm. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and did you have siblings? I have a brother who's three years younger, and uh, he is uh, at the University of Rochester Medical School, and he does dermatology research up there. Brainy, brainy brood, huh? Well, we didn't know it. <laughs> you know, I applied to two local schools. Uh-huh. One was Tufts and one was Harvard, and I got into both. <laughs> both of them gave me money. The difference was Harvard made me commute. They did not want this blue-collar dame in their dorm. Huh. So I didn't go. I went mm-hmm. to Tufts. Mm-hmm. And my brother followed me to Tufts, because you know, mm-hmm. they gave us him a full scholarship as mm-hmm. well. You can't do that anymore. To get that kind of scholarship? No. Yeah, it's no. different. No. And my cousins all went to Harvard. Mm-hmm. But... We, you know, at the time, we didn't think anything. We were just, the idea that you were going to college was what we, and they were, we didn't have, I didn't have an awareness of what being in Harvard meant. Hmm. That's how out of it I was at the time. I knew they were good schools, but. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so your, your dad was a gardener. Yeah. How, how had he gotten into growing food? I think food? From, from his own family. Okay. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, canned and you know so the, whatever he grew if he grew enough of it she would put it up so she made like with a rhubarb she would make jams and stuff and so I always saw in my family um, a, a part of the life was you know growing your own food as much as you can preserving as much as you can every year she would put up all kinds of food that we would have over the winter and it just felt to me like that's what people did mm-hmm. you know I didn't realize that it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so for instance, when you would go to school, if you were your your lunch, right, had this kind of locally grown and preserved stuff. Right. Was that? Did you notice a difference? I didn't between people's cold cut sandwiches that they were eating. Or? Well, we didn't eat at school. We went home for lunch. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, I think by the time we got into high school. We, I could notice that you know they were eating things that we didn't eat, mm-hmm. but I there was a a butcher shop near us, and my mother would always send me up there to get the churned butter mm-hmm. that they would make right there. And so it was just my sense of that's the way it was mm-hmm. until I got out of that area. When I um, was in graduate school, my grandmother, when we had Thanksgiving. My grandmother stuffed the turkey with what is known as a farce, F-A-R-C-E. It's ground spice beef and lamb and whatever. 
So I had no awareness that people stuffed their turkeys with bread until I went to somebody's house, and I was blown away by the fact that they weren't eating what we ate. Uh-huh. And we still make it, and we there are several families that we eat together for the holidays, mm-hmm. and I bring that stuffing every time. Wow. Yeah. So what was... Uh, was your grandmother's cooking out of a particular cultural background at yeah, all? Yeah, I think it was it was French. Okay. And um, my mother and she divided. She made my grandmother made all the pies. My mother made all the cakes. My mother would make the donuts. My grandmother would make the rolls. We would have fresh rolls every night. I mean, they made their own bread. It was like you know, that's what you did. So. Right. You had bread and butter, and, and I think about it now, and I think, oh my God. <laughs> but it was fresh. It was all fresh. Yeah. yeah. That's, right. Right. that's pretty good for you, even if it's yeah. kind of fatty. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but you said your grandmother kind of held you away from learning. She, yeah, she said, you're not going to need to do any of this. You're going to go to school, and you're going to be you know, your own person. And she didn't have an idea of what that meant other than... You know, you weren't going to be in the house. Yeah. It really is what she... Do you think that she thought it would even hold you back? Yeah. 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 Which is fascinating because my mother knit. My mother didn't make lace, but she knit. And when I went to graduate school, I shared a, a room with this woman, Jackie Briggs, who was the Betty Crocker house maker of the year for the state of Maine. <laughs> so we lived together and Jackie taught me how to make clothes. She taught me how to knit. She taught me how to develop film in the bathroom. Wow. And then she didn't come back the next year. She, she didn't come back after the first year. Huh. But, you know, so I, I knit. I yeah. knit, you know, Beautiful. I make uh, all kinds of things mm-hmm. for knitting. But they didn't teach me with it. How did you feel about that? I mean, that... At the time, I didn't understand it, mm-hmm. and then when I was in school, I resented it because I, f- I saw it as a skill set that I would want. Mm-hmm. I would want to know how to put up food, and I still, when when I my kids were young, I would put up food just because it was to me it was something special. Mm-hmm. You know, I go out and if I didn't have it in the garden, I'd go buy, go to the farms and buy lots of tomatoes or you know something and put it up. Yeah, keep it for the winter. Do you think, I mean, you know, at the time that you're describing, which is, would have been 60s? 50s. 50s and 60s. 60s. Yeah, I, I graduated mean, college in 62 and grad school in 66. Do you... No. Uh, college in 66 and grad school in 70. Okay. Would that have been unusual at that point for a family to have supported their daughter or kind of chosen, push their daughter to kind of make that choice, to kind of yeah. not not yeah. learn some of the it more was very domestic mi- skills. It was very unusual, and yeah. it, it, I can remember my father saying to me, every generation betters itself. Mm-hmm. It was like giving me permission, mm-hmm. and I didn't realize for a long time the amount of discrimination that was going on with women. Mm-hmm. When I got to college, I had a professor, her name was Zella Luria. She was a, uh, a little, uh, like four foot something, Jewish lady from the Bronx. And she was married, she taught at Tufts. She was married to Salvatore Loria, who was at MIT. He got the Nobel Prize in biochem, and he gave it to SDS and got blacklisted. So I figured this was my kind of people. Wow. But she became my mentor, and I didn't know that. I didn't know what a mentor was. But I had applied to Yale in neurophysiology for graduate school, and she said, don't do it, they don't take women. So I did it, they didn't take me, so I went to Europe. So she picks up the phone, she calls my father. My mother had died when I was 17 of breast cancer. She calls him and she says, get her home, I got her in at Minnesota, she's got a full scholarship, drive her out there and don't take anything off of her. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. And that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And that's, I never applied to grad school, I just, went out there. And, uh-huh. But when I gave my first paper in Santa Monica, she showed up for the paper. She came out to hear me present. Wow. And when I came to Washington, um, uh, I came because my husband was clerking on the Supreme Court. We came out of Minnesota. And, uh, she, and I was writing the child abuse regulations for the country. That's what I did first. 
She called me up and she said, I want to do some research on sex differences in children. Can you get, help me get a grant at NIH? And I felt absolutely honored. By then I understood what mentoring meant. Mm -hmm. So I did. Mm -hmm. I felt like it was a closed circle. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of neat. And that would have been a, a very different culture of academia at that time if she just kind of called somebody up and That's right. got you in. That's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Can't really do that no, anymore. anymore. Yeah. No. For better she, or for worse. She knew all, you know, they knew the pe people in, the, in their field and she was in psychology. And so yeah. you can't do that now. Yeah. No. With your, you talked about the the domestic skills that your grandma kind of made a pointedly did not teach you. With your father gardening, did he, were you learning that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and she would do things like, rhubarb was special. So when the rhubarb came in, she'd show me how to cook it. Yeah. But most cooking, no. But he would, you know, whatever he was growing, he would show me, you know. And he would, I remember him talking about how you know, you had to be very careful when you planted because of the frost, and it was you had a very short growing season. And, very short. You know, <laughs> but, it, but it was part of my life. It was just the way it was. And my mother would come home, and I oh, she would come home, and every month the hospitals at that time would throw out the old blood because they didn't have a way of preserving it. So she'd come home every month with a pint or two and pour it on the roses. And I would go bananas. I would say, if anybody sees this, I am going to be blacklisted. And she'd say, hush up, I've got the best roses in town. <laughs> and she did. <laughs> yeah, blood. I mean, yeah. you can buy blood meal That's fertilizer right. now. Right. I mean, it's I, not from the hospital. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so you were there in the garden with your dad. Yeah. yeah. A fair amount. You Absolutely. were right there. Yeah. yeah. Because my kids, every... When they were in this house, every week there'd be a bouquet of flowers on that table from mm -hmm. something I've grown. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, these are zinnias, mm -hmm. you know, these are lily of the valley. These mm -hmm. are th they would not know one from another. And I'd say, how can you grow up in this household with me showing you all of these things and you just don't focus? And they just didn't. They were into Mario Brothers and computer games. and. Now that my son is older, he, he lives nearby with his girlfriend and he's applying to PA school. He wants to be a physician's assistant. He comes over and now he'll say, are these zinnias? And I'll say, yes. Hmm. He says, are these tulips? i say, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so it's You can't identify a tulip? <laughs> <laughs> Can you believe that? Um, well, that's interesting. So when we talk about your kids, it'll be interesting to hear more about that. Yeah. What competed for their attention yeah, with the yeah, gardening? Yeah. What it? But with your your father's style of gardening, you know. W were there many other people of his generation or peers who were growing their own food Not around, around there? Us. No. no. Okay. It was, we were in a very small single family house that I think they were able to purchase because my grandmother had worked in a shoe factory and had a small house in Exeter, New Hampshire, and sold it when she moved so that they bought a small house and lived in it, but we were surrounded by apartment buildings. So I didn't see anybody else growing it. But I knew, like he would say, these are Mark Loeb tomatoes. These are a really good tomato. When you, when you plant your tomatoes, you need to find them if you can find them, and I have. Mm -hmm. And he would say, when you plant your tomatoes, plant them all the way down, only have a little bit showing because the root structure. You know, so he was, you know. So my kids, when I started, they'd say, well, how do you know to do that? I say, well, my dad taught me, mm -hmm. and I'll teach you. <laughs> um, do you remember anything else about his his gardening style that was unique to him? No, or? I don't. Mm -hmm. No, just had a little plot at the back end of the house where there was sun. Mm -hmm. And you know, what else did he grow besides tomatoes? I can't remember. I know he grew other things. I, my guess is he grew. Um, well, he grew onions and he grew beans. Mm -hmm. And he said there were a lot of things he couldn't grow because of the season length. Yeah. But I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, well, that's, that sounds like you're at a good yeah. special education yeah, as but, an early But gardener. I didn't know it. You sure, know, you sure. Just, you just so that would be my next question. Then you went to college. It sounds like that was yeah. kind of... 
you it was just an saw eye opener. an eye opener. Yeah. And how about around food? I mean that. When I went to college, that we we ate in the in the cafeteria, and it just was bizarre to me. I mean, mm-hmm. and and the the food the food most of it didn't taste good, mm-hmm. and it, it took me a while to get used to the fact that I wasn't eating the way I ate at home. The things didn't t- sound taste as fresh and they weren't Mm -hmm. and everybody put on a lot of weight as I remember at that time so that was and it was it wasn't eating wasn't something that was you know a special pleasure to me it wasn't where I focused but I was very aware that the food wasn't good yeah I mean was it prior to that would you have said that eating was a pleasure to you or something that yeah oh yeah. yeah 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 But it wasn't, you know, I ate and then I went and did what I needed to do. Yeah. And this, I mean, at that point, kind of processed food was kind of, yeah. had made its way yeah. into the, I mean, was yeah. that the kind of thing that it's you were eating was, in the right, dorm? Yeah. Right, right. And I, you know, since I've gotten out of grad school, I don't eat processed food. Mm-hmm. I make my own or I, you know, and when the kids were little, they used to make fun of me. Because I'd say, you've got to eat, this, you drink, the, they would drink tremendous amounts of milk, and I'd say, you've got, you've got to eat, drink this, because it doesn't have the hormones in it, which they didn't understand. Mm-hmm. And they used to make fun of me. And they, I mean, they were born in 82 and 87, so it was in the early 90s, and they would make fun of me, and I'd say, you know, you don't understand, there's not good things in all of this. Mm. You know? And now they remember, and they say, oh, God would give you such a hard time, and I said, well... You know, I was doing what I thought I could do to make sure that you ate properly. And, yeah. You know, there was no processed food in this house. My kid used to open the fridge and say, there's nothing in here. And I'd say, there's no junk in there. Yeah. There's vegetables and fruits and this <laughs> and that. And, you know. uh-huh. So, uh, anything else, what else from that t- point of that period of time when you went to college, decided you got into science? I was always in science, and um, the, this mentor really pushed me. I didn't know whether I really wanted to be in psychology in graduate school, although I knew I liked it. But, you know, I think I wasn't thinking about career. I was thinking, hey, they're paying me to learn. You know what? If they're paying, I'm going. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind this. You know, if I don't like what I'm learning, I'll leave. I'll go do something else. Yeah. And I loved it. I got out to Minnesota, and I loved it. Yeah. I just loved the whole process of it. Did you? So you didn't necessarily have. I had identified. Oh, academia is uh-uh. this the career I want to do. No. That okay. No. What I said was, I like the field. If they're going to pay me to study. You know, it's kind of neat to get a Ph.D. Both my brother and I have them. I'm clear that some message was given to us, you know. And um, if I don't like it, I'll move on. If I, I, I was very interested in neurophysiology. Mm-hmm. And so I did a minor in that out there. But I loved it. Mm-hmm. I, and I love Minnesota. It was totally different. I remember going into an, a department store, and I'm walking through the first floor, and some guy turns to me and says, Hi! Which tie do you like better? And I said, I beg your pardon. I mean, you could drop dead on the streets of Boston, and if you haven't been introduced, you don't talk. So, right. so it was a whole different experience of very open, very friendly people, and they also were very focused on food. They, most of them were farmers. You know, mm-hmm. that whole area it was a farmer, farmers' democratic party at that mm-hmm. time, and uh, so it was a, it was a very, it was a very good time in yeah. my life. Yeah. Do you remember during college and grad school, did you still face that that tension or that choice between domestic and... I didn't because yeah. I think I was ignorant. Like when I think about it now, when I think that Harvard accepted me and was going to tell me to commute, back then I just said, no, I don't want to commute. But when I think of what they did and why, how they did it, and I'm sure they had, I mean, I came with a set of credentials that was very unusual. I'm sure at some level they wanted to accept me. They just don't want me in the dorm. But it took me a while to realize that that was discrimination. Mm-hmm. But when I was in college... And I, discrimination around kind of class. That's right. Is, is that's what right. Okay. Class discrimination. 
But when I was in college, I knew there were a lot of people that were very wealthy that were there. And to me, it, I, it wasn't where I focused. I was really focused on, you know, this is my opportunity to do really well. And when I got to graduate school, there were more people like me in the sense that we were all interested in science and we were, it was a much more, it, I feel I had a more social grouping when I got into grad school. But when I came to Washington, my professor in grad school had come from Yale that year to teach at Minnesota, and then he came to D.C. and became the head of the Office of Child Development in HEW. So he asked me if I would be a special assistant. So when I came, I, I went into government. That's what brought you to Washington? No, what brought me to Washington was my husband was clerking on the Supreme Court. He had gone to law school out there while I was doing my grad work. And um, when I came, there was nobody under 30 in, in the office to begin with. Mm -hmm. And there were no women, no young women. And I remember I had written these child abuse regs and given different states money as part of my job to help with um, developing child abuse programs in the states. And I remember one day being in my office and this guy from Texas with the hat and the boots, huge, leans against the doorway in my office and he says to me, do you mean to tell me you are what's between me and getting some money? Mm -hmm. And without thinking, I turned it around and I said, you give me your name and I'll make sure I am. And that was the beginning of my getting a sense that there were different kinds of discrimination going on. Mm -hmm. He turned white. You know, and I, I hadn't even, that came out of, I don't know where that came from, but, <laughs> but I never felt when I, I did finally go to teach at Catholic U, and I had a federal grant at that time, and I had applied for summer money, and I was the only woman in that program in Catholic, and they refused to let me take the summer money because none of the men had it, and I said to them, look, you're, the university's giving overhead for this. And if you do this, I'll report you to the government. And I did. And they were furious. And I said, you know, what's this? If you want some money, go get a grant. Yeah. But it was that kind of thing. And it wasn't always blatant, but it wasn't great. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. great. During uh, going into graduate school, I mean, you talked about being in Minnesota where you were probably agriculture and food growing as a way of life was more in your face. That's right. Were you able to, did you reconnect with your own gardening Not at during all. that time at all? I no. couldn't, I couldn't, and it was worse than Boston in the sense of the growing season. Yeah. But the thing that was noticeable is a lot of people in that program were from the East Coast or the West Coast, but the students who were from the Midwest they were all married, they were all being supported by the extended families. Many of them were grown, grown up on farms. They were mm. totally different than anything I had experienced before. I remember going to Ames, Iowa, with one of the students. She brought me home for, I don't know what, and her father, stands, he was a farmer, and he stood there and he says, I've never met a Catholic before. Mm. And I thought, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it just, at that time, I guess it was, you know, being aware that there were so many different ways to live life. Yeah. But I didn't get back involved into growing things until I came here. Okay. And then I started growing things. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other memories of just food culture at that time? Uh, or? Minnesota? Yeah. Oh, God. It was a whole different culture. Yeah. The, the Lutheran Church would have ludific fish uh, on, Fisk, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on Fridays and everybody would come uh -huh. and have these big dinners and I had never tasted it so I went and it was good you know uh -huh. and they would do things like ice fish in the winter and everybody would bring out food to the they would have these little cabins with uh -huh. the whole now they have huge like there's a there was a picture and I forget PBS the a huge bar that they rolled out onto the ice and you go inside the bar, and there's six stools, and behind each stool is a hole so you can drink and fish at the same time. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a whole different thing now. <laughs> but back then it was, you know. But there was a lot of family p 
potlucks and cooking and yeah. you know, yeah. which felt more like home, you know. Hmm. Even though it was the different food, the Lutheran yeah. Midwestern version, yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. yeah. Uh, and you had you had identified kind of your career path at that point, yeah. but had you also thought about your your life? as a whole that you wanted to live? I mean, did you want a family? Did you want to have your own garden? Yeah, that kind absolutely. of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. But it was interesting. My, um, the, my, my professor that was my mentor there, his wife was also a professor, and she was the only woman. She was from Smith originally. And she would say things like, you know, it's not worth it. What I make goes to child care. And, you know, I had never heard anything like that before because, I, I mean, hmm. she was the only one I was exposed to. And at the time, it was true, you know. Mm-hmm. So my sense was, well, you know, I definitely want a family. I definitely want to settle. But I assumed I would go back to Boston to do that. But I stayed here, and we stayed here. And unfortunately, later we divorced, mm-hmm. and my ex-husband went back to Boston. But I stayed, mm-hmm. just stayed on. And had, you had met him in Boston? Or? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And then you both went to Minnesota. I met him in Boston, and I went to Minnesota, and he went down to New Orleans to teach for a year. And then um, he came out, he applied to law school, came out to law school, and he was the head of law review. And when they picked Berger as the Supreme Court Chief Justice, he brought my husband with him. So that's why we came here. Okay. Um. Yeah, but you had a, so you you saw a a woman in academia who was kind of thinking about how having a career had affected. But absolutely. But it's interesting. I mean, because I still know people, men and women, who are saying that same thing. I mean, I think maybe yeah, it hasn't changed that all your money goes to childcare now. It's just that I, I know couples. Right. The Where di- the trade-off might be more balanced in terms of who's right. making the sacrifice. The <laughs> difference for me was there were no women, so this was unusual to hear somebody. You didn't hear the male professors say that. Of course not. <laughs> but, so she was unique in that she was the only female role model that I saw. Mm-hmm. And, and she, you know, she didn't quit. She didn't stay home. She, she sure. was very well known in what she did, but... You know, it was like, whoa, where's that coming from? What's that about, you know? Yeah. Um, so you came to Washington. Right. Your, your husband was a clerking for the... He started off with Berger and ended up with Justice White from okay. Boston. So this, yeah. that's I heard no the, slouch no, <laughs> credentials. I heard the Pentagon papers argued. It was really... Huh, okay. Back when, yeah. Where did you live when you came to Washington? We bought a house on Capitol Hill. And there was a little garden in the back, and uh, I grew a few things, but what I did grow was marijuana. Oh. I found seeds somewhere, <laughs> and I had this beautiful plant. I mean, I'd never seen it. I, and, you know, I think about it now, and I think, he was a lawyer, and I, and I you know, well, it didn't last, but I thought, wow, this is kind of neat. I didn't know what it looked like. And this is early 70s? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did, I mean, we don't have to put this in a recorded interview. I mean, were you, but were you growing it? No, I was growing it because I wanted to see what it looked like. Okay. I don't remember where I got the seeds. Somebody had, somebody at at school had given me the seeds. (laughs) But, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't a big plot I had, but I did do that and that, then that disappeared. I, (laughs) Where on Capitol Hill was the house? It was 116 11th Street. It was just off of Lincoln Park. Uh-huh. And the woman that lived next to us was an old lady, and she said she could remember when they walked the cows down the um, the inner sort of, I don't know what you call it. It was, it was like a road, but they walked them right down to the water hmm. from where we were. Because there were people who had actually been raising cattle That's within right. her lifetime That's in Capitol right. Hill. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So she had already, I mean... She'd seen the real change. There's been some dramatic development yeah. Yeah. in the lifetime since then. Right. But prior to that, she right. saw that development. Yeah. And what was, I mean, what was Capitol Hill like in the early 70s? It was, 
in the process of being developed, I remember yeah, we lived pr pretty much on the edge of where the development was because one year in the f in the front, I was planting something and some kid walked by and pinched my butt and you know kept on going. <coughs> but um, there were a lot of people I knew that lived there. There were young people there primarily, and it we all got together, you know, around um, the Eastern Market and what was going on there, and so it. It was, it was an active place, but it was under development. One side of Lincoln Park, where I lived, was developed. The other side wasn't. So that's, we were right at the edge of where mm -hmm. the development was occurring. Was it, I mean, right now, now Capitol Hill is just a very affluent, expensive part of town. Was it at that time? No. 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 And when I got divorced, um, at one point, I had looked out here because I felt this area reminded me of Boston. So I sold that house and came out here and, as I said, tried to get a mortgage but couldn't, so I paid cash for the house initially and then refinanced it. How long did you live on Capitol Hill? Uh, maybe three years. Okay. And you, so you had a little bit of dirt in the back to <laughs> start growing? Yeah. Marijuana and <laughs> what? But did you also start growing food? I didn't have enough room. Okay. I mean, it really was. Yeah. It was a, like a brick patio. Little there was house. a black walnut tree that used to drop the black walnuts, and they. I mean, I would save them and make you know. And eat them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there wasn't there wasn't enough really to grow anything. Okay. Um, you talked about Eastern Market. I mean, yeah. what? A, what was Eastern Market, like the market itself like back it, then? It was not like it is now, well, it's burned and then, yeah. but it, it felt like an old market. It felt like, you know, it was all wood and farmers would come and they'd put up, it wasn't like, there weren't cases of food the way, they, they developed later, but there weren't the cases of food. It was more, the farmers would come, put their food, they all had a certain space. Mm -hmm. And uh, and sell it, and then there would be people outside selling crafts or you know whatever, depending on the season. But it felt to me, you know, close to the real food in, in mm -hmm. terms of you know being able to get something that was fresh. Yeah. Would you buy? Oh yeah. A bunch of your food there. Yeah. yeah. I buy a lot of the vegetables there. Mm -hmm. I didn't buy much of the meat because it was so expensive, but I bought a lot of the vegetables that I got there. Yeah. And you had started your family at that point? No. Okay. What happened was I, I wanted a, we both wanted a family, but I couldn't have kids, which was part of the divorce. Uh -huh. So later on, I, did, uh, I adopted two kids from Oregon hmm. at birth from a, an adoption center out there. Then um, Sam was a day old. And hmm. Molly was five days old. And I had remarried, and we brought them to this house. And um, their dad died of pancreatic cancer a while after that. And we, I mean, they came into this house, and they, they've been here. Well, my daughter is in New Orleans right now, but my son lives around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> he loves this area. And my best friends across the street, their son and his wife are right around the corner. Hmm. One of the things that's unique about, I feel, Tacoma, or at least it has been for me, is the people I met when I came here are still my friends. My book club is 25 years old, the same people. My friends are the same people. My One of my best friends, their youngest son and Sam are babies together, and we still all get together. Yeah. You know? So it's a... It's a it's a community that didn't move. I guess is the mm. way I would say it. I think that's no longer so much the case. Mm -hmm. But at that time, yeah, you know, we we're all still here. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Did you when you uh, so when you moved to Washington, you were setting up, you know, kind of had your own house and then came here to come apart. Did you start doing your own cooking at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've always done my own cooking. Okay. Yeah. And it was important to me even then, although I didn't understand it in the same way I understand it now, 
that you know I I would make food. I I wasn't you know I made the soups. I made the bread. I made you know I I started cooking the way I had been fed. Mm -hmm. So the kids grew up with that, but they didn't understand it. But they would hear me talk about well I could wish I could get organic blah blah blah, and they would tease me. I didn't understand it. Yeah. But was that was that a I mean that was something that was you were exposed to in your own growing up but when you started doing it was it a conscious choice yes. like I I did not want my kids drinking milk that had hormones in it I knew uh -huh. too much of the science I knew what happened Yeah you know? I knew that the menstruation age was going down the kid boys had little titties and I didn't want any part and I said that to my son I said you don't get it, but you know, you're know you not going to drink milk that has this stuff in it. And I'm not going to buy food to the extent I can that you know has processed stuff in it. Or Back then, I wasn't as aware of the amount of antibiotics going into the meat as I am now. But we didn't eat a lot of meat. We ate a lot of chicken and fish. And, mm -hmm. But I mostly made everything. And, you know, and I think they saw that growing up. My daughter is a really good cook, and I think we used to cook together. My son, <laughs> you know, I said, these kids need to know how to sew on a button, cook a meal, do their wash, fill out a checkbook. Mm -hmm. you know. So you kind of took the, the opposite tack from what your grandmother and yeah. parents had yeah. taken in yeah. terms of right. kind of practical Absolutely. homemaking skills. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted them, I wanted them to have a sense that, you know, I think for my grandparent, my grandmother and my parents, they saw education as a, a, a an upward yeah. growth. And it was, you know, the message was education would get you more freedom in life, which it clearly did. But for me, what I saw was, yes, education is very important but that you know you've got to learn things you've got to learn how to take care of yourself mm -hmm. and i had the hardest time with my son when he graduated college the banks had started putting all the, the saving checking accounts online and he didn't understand the float and he would get hit 35 dollars week after week because he looked to see what he had written but he hadn't you didn't fill out the you didn't balance it. <laughs> you didn't balance it. Yeah. I said, what part of this don't you get? He yeah. said, well, I look online. I said, Samuel, that is that is not the same as knowing that you have written checks that are outstanding that have not been cashed yet. And finally, I guess when he went broke, <laughs> he, he learned the lesson. But the banks, I think, were doing it on purpose. I think they had yeah. a group of kids that were used to being online. And, yeah. Um, you talked about buying this house here in Tacoma Park. Can you say that, tell that story a little more? <laughs> I mean, why did you have to buy it in cash? Well, originally, I, um, I had friends that were out here, and I loved the area. And um, I met a woman who was a friend of a neighbor who sold houses. She was a real estate agent, which was, and she was good, and she was very successful. And I had looked at a house, it was a farmhouse over on the other side of Tacoma. Uh, the man that was selling it had raised five kids there and he was retired and his wife had passed on and I I wanted to buy it because it was a huge amount of land. Yeah. And there was another guy who also was interested in it and he went to the guy and said, I'm going to get married and I'm going to raise kids in this house and I really want this house. And even though my contract was in. That had been the guy gave the house to him, which I guess you could no longer do. But that was what happened. So I went back to my friend and said, "Let me see." Here, I'll pause it. Okay. Hello. I went back to my friend and mm -hmm. said, uh, "I'm not going to get that house." She knew it. I said, "Is there any other house?" And she said, "Well." I just found out the city is selling a house. They got a HUD grant, and they are seeding certain areas to keep them from being torn down. So she showed me this house, uh -huh. and I said, "Done." You know? Yeah. So um, 
I wrote a contract, the city accepted it. The house was a mess. The city had tried to renovate it back to a single family dwelling, but the sink didn't vent. I mean, there was a lot going on, but it was a beginning. And, yeah. um, but so, was it habitable? Yeah. yeah. It was habitable, and uh, as I said, in the winters, it, it wasn't, the steam heat didn't work very well, so I lived in the uh, fireplace room. But uh, is the cat? She's playing with the cord. It's okay. She'll get bored and move on. <laughs> so, um, so I bought it and um, started work on it, as I remember. And, and you were not remarried? No. Yeah, okay. I bought it. I started renovating it, and I uh, I found a plumber that retrofitted all of the radiators to hot water heat. Mm -hmm. Omar was his name. He used to say things three times, but he was great. And then I found I slowly found people to work on it. So when I moved here, this wasn't here. The kitchen was just that small area there, and that wasn't the original kitchen. The original kitchen was downstairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I put on, in the other room, uh, a sleep-in porch I, I framed in. I just slowly started working on it, and I would refinance it and take some money out and keep working on it, and, you know, which I've done forever. But uh, it slowly you know, became mine in the sense that I knew every square inch of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, and loved it. I mean, it's a solid house. It's a lot of the trim is chestnut wood, you know, and my friend who has, uh, he built the kitchen for me. He's, his son and Molly were babies together. And he says to me, you can't get wood anymore like you can get wood. The wood that you mm -hmm. buy now is so porous that it rots right away. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the kind of wood that was in this house is so solid, it was just... Right. Yeah. Right. What was Tacoma Park, Tacoma, like at that point? This is, so this is <laughs> mid to late 70s, or...? Yeah, uh, 78. Tacoma then was in tr major transition, and I remember when I first moved here, the metro had opened. I knew nobody. So I'd sit on the front porch with a case of beer, and as people came back, I'd, all, I'd say, hi, you want a beer? And I'd get to know them. <laughs> and everybody, it, it still happens, everybody walks down the street, yeah. you know, goes to the metro. And that that was kind of fun in that sense of, you know. But it was in transition. I had somebody that came up one time, and I was sitting on the porch and said, I remember when my boyfriend used to run his motorcycle off these steps. And I'm thinking, woo. And that little picture over there of the flowers, somebody showed up to, with that and said, my mother was an artist and she lived upstairs in the turret room with a monkey. <laughs> so, you know, it, what I did know was the house was owned by a dentist who had his office downstairs before it became a rooming house. But I think the whole area, you know, really was in transition. It was which I liked. I, mm -hmm. I liked being in a community that wasn't upper class. I liked being in a community where everybody was a little eccentric. Mm -hmm. and to me, it was just where I wanted to be. Yeah. So. I mean, who lived here? You say not upper class. Like, was there? Uh, a... There were a lot of people. Like the fellow who lived behind me was a blue collar guy, and he walked around at night with a shotgun. Mm hmm. And he did that because he was sure that the metro was going to bring out criminals. Mm hmm. And um, so he died in that house. That house was put together from houses in the city. They took pieces of old houses and built it. That was on this property's land. This property used to go way back. And, um, and there were also young families. As I said, mm -hmm. there was 18 kids on this block that were children. There were a lot of young families. But I remember moving in and like the Victorian two down there was an old couple that were leaving that had raised their family there. On the other side of the street, there was a, a fellow from the Department of Agriculture who had developed specific kinds of azaleas hmm. um, that are very well known. That um, So there were, I think there was the older people here, they were around this area were academics or they were federal researchers. But also there were some that were just, there were families that had been here for more than one generation. Mm -hmm. And it was all kind of mixed up. Yeah. 
And you started a garden as soon as you got here? Yeah. <laughs> well, when I got here, there was nothing here. The city had taken everything out. So I, everything that you see, the cedar, everything I planted. So when so I the got the trees here, also, yeah. All the trees, I mean, everything mm -hmm. started with me. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, I did more than the garden. I mean, I, I did the garden, but I also knew I wanted green along here, although I never assumed I'd be here long enough to see it like it is now. But, and then uh, I planted a corner garden so that in the spring the crocus would come up and they'd be flowering until the late fall. So I just kind of had that going. Mm -hmm. And um, and people would stop and comment on it. And, you know, and, and then I did the garden and the kids were, I think like, Sam might have been seven and Molly four or five, but they, you know, I have pictures of them in the garden, hoeing and... Yeah. So in terms of ha starting a little food garden, you waited till the, yeah, k the yeah, kids could yeah, participate yeah, to start yeah, that? You weren't yeah. doing it on your own? Not then. Okay. What got me going again was them huh. and the kids. There, there were so many kids, we all decided that we would do it as a, a community garden. So uh -huh. all of the adults got involved. Like, But my, here at your house? Yeah. Yeah. Because I had the only son. Okay. And Herb, who lived around the corner then, he came, he grew up on a farm in New Jersey, so he came and he'd turn everything over, and then we'd get all the kids and we'd figure out what seeds were going to go where, and mm -hmm. so everybody planted, we planted potatoes one of the first years, that they thought that was magic, you know, and dig sunflowers, and, and we did it for several years, and then they kind of got bored, but I was hooked. Yeah. So... I got myself a little rototiller, one of those little mantis dealies, and I just... How big was the, the plot that you were working on with all those kids? Pretty much the full backyard. Okay. It's much smaller now, but it was... We, we got everything, and we, we grew corn. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, we did whatever we could. We wanted them to see. Yeah. We wanted them to watch. You know. So, I, what else? I mean, say more about that garden. I mean, how many... How did it work? How did you divvy up the food? <laughs> well, you know, it was really interesting. It was not so much the food. I think they were very interested in planting the seeds, and they were fascinated by watching it grow. Just fascinating by seeing that, you know, one day there was just a tiny little plant, and, you know, pretty soon there were tomatoes or something like that. So to me, the process of it was what caught them to begin with, much more than the food. Yeah. Um, a lot of them weren't interested in you know, vegetables. But we did, we had them all harvest, and I think at the time we kind of split it up, whatever, whoever wanted. A lot of the kids really liked the potatoes because they thought they came from match. I mean, they just came out of the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, there was, you know, I think everybody took a little something. And, yeah. Yeah. Did you try and pass on the, the science of it all to them? No, no, <laughs> they were too young. Yeah. They were too young. But they did know that um, from the beginning that it was an organic garden, that I didn't use any pesticides, I didn't use anything, and that, you know, that that was unusual, and that it meant that they were going to see bugs on things, and that was the way it was, and you picked them off, and, mm -hmm. and that was, that's always been so. They've always known that. You know. Did, uh, do you know of the kids that came and did that in the neighborhood? Do you remember? I mean, do you know if any of them continued to garden as adults? Or No, none of them did. Herb, who, as I said, grew up, he and his family lived around the corner. They since moved. But he knew farming. But he, he didn't grow anything in his yard. He grew flowers, but he didn't grow vegetables. It wasn't a big deal back then. I think people didn't, I mean, it was unusual that I was growing food mm -hmm. around here anyhow. They, it wasn't like now where everybody wants to grow their own. Yeah. You know, so I wasn't, again, seeing around me other gardens. Even here in Tacoma, right. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I just didn't see it. There was, was there a farmer's market nearby? The Not initially. When the farmer's market came in, people came from everywhere for the food because it was so fresh and everything. And, but the farmer's market started, I can't remember when, but I was here for a while before that market started. Mm -hmm. And I would go up there to get the tomatoes that my squirrels would eat, you know. But you know, I'd go up and 
you know, talk to the guys, and one year I said to them, I planted squash, and I got a lot of flowers, but I didn't get any squash, and the guy looks at me and says, uh, you have to plant two to make babies. Yeah, you I gotta said, have a boy and a girl. I didn't know that. <laughs> He's, I said, I didn't know that. Well, I had probably planted two and not thought twice about it. Uh-huh. Just So I would go out and chat with them and talk to them about what they were growing. And, uh-huh. you know. Yeah. But nobody else did. They huh. still make fun. Of, well, they make fun of me just because I put this cage up. But they, you know, they understand that the food is fresh, and they understand that, you know, now my son with his girlfriend, they go up to that farmer's market. She buys that food all the time. Uh huh. Yeah. So he has more of an appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At that, I mean, you talked about uh, doing an organic garden and not just making a point of serving fresh food to your kids was that I mean was that were people talking about that much by the time you were raising your kids no but my brother I didn't realize that my father used DDT because back then they did just in his little backyard garden Uh and my brother one day called me up he was already at Rochester I think he'd finish his doctorate he said, do you know what Dad used to do? I said, no. He said, do you know what he sprayed stuff with? I said, no. He says, he, we are exposed to DDT. I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. That was it. I said, well, if we live long enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. But that's what they did. I, can't, I mean, I knew my dad well enough to know that he wouldn't do it if he, didn't, if he knew that it was bad. Yeah. But once my brother said that, it, that was it. Nothing was going in my yard. Yeah. That's how I started. Uh-huh. <laughs> Did you, I mean, so knowing that your family had been exposed to those, as a lot of families, I mean, right. people right. didn't think twice about it no. at that time. Did, no. But did you, do, you, do you know if there was any particular consequence to I, that? I don't know. I know that my mother died of breast cancer mm-hmm. um, premenopausally. But and there was no breast can- there was no cancer in the family, mm-hmm. but I you know who knows yeah. what that was I don't know. Yeah. But you know both my brother and I so far are healthy. Mm-hmm. So you know. Um, so what else did you grow in your garden? Did you grow those Mar Globe tomatoes? I grew the Mar Globe tomatoes. I found them. Are those a beef steak? What, what are they're, Mar Globes? They're a beef steak, but they're a, they're an heirloom, uh-huh. and um, they're. Apparently, my dad liked them because they they did well with a shorter period of the summer. But they're they're a solid beef steak tomato. I used to find them out at metal farms because they would bring out tomatoes and I would. But um, what I grew, what I've always grown, I've always had a flower garden, and then I've always grown zinnias, and then I've always grown lots of different tomatoes. I've grown um, bush beans, squash. Eggplant, peppers. Um, that's pretty much it. One variety or another. I've recently discovered more heirloom seeds through a catalog, and um, this year I grew bush beans that were heirloom beans. Mm-hmm. One of them was like looked like a zebra. It was yellow with a purple zigzag on it mm-hmm. that disappeared when you cooked it. But um, and um, this year I didn't. I didn't have as much of a garden because I had um, I had uh, a tendon severed in my hand, so I was in a cast and a splint for a long period of time. So the garden is not the way it usually is. But I would grow the same thing. I tried asparagus. It didn't really do. It it, it had too many bugs on it. Hmm. They ate the tips off, so I figured I wasn't going to spray. So I did that. I didn't do that anymore. And. Uh, well, I have strawberries I tried for a while, but pretty much what I do every year is the same. Mm-hmm. And so you just got seeds from well, I wherever. Grew, <laughs> right, but over the past years I'm much more aware of and interested in the heirloom seeds that you can get. And, you know, to the extent that I can get them, that's what I buy. And I love them. Yeah. Know. Have you... And which ones, which varieties have you taken well, I, to? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have the names of them. There's okay. a, uh, I'm 
black and on the name of the there's like, like Johnny Seeds has a lot of heirlooms, but this I have one that's in the Midwest, but I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. But I go looking for things that are old, that um, you know are prolific and you know, yeah. different in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you you describe the your community here in Tacoma and the. The families here on the block. It sounds yeah. like there was a pretty strong right. bond among parents Absolutely. and kids. Yeah. Is do you still see that? Do you see that continuing that kind of thing in Tacoma? I don't see it here because we're all still here. Yeah. Like the families across the street raised their kids with me. Um, the house next door recently sold, and a young couple have moved in with a three-year-old. And I know that they are now making friends with three-year-olds around. So I think it is happening. It's just that I don't see it because mm -hmm. I'm not as much involved. You don't sit on the porch with your beer? Anymore? Oh, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that and I think, oh, my God. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want a beer? <laughs> um, nice. Uh, do you, are there more gardeners now? Oh, my God. Yeah. One, a couple of years ago, because you can get the mulch from the city. Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of years ago, I waited until, I went down to make my order the end of April, the beginning of May. They were sold out. Mm. Um, and usually, you don't, you don't get the mulch until May. There were so many farmers that were going after it in Tacoma that huh. they sold out. I thought, whoa, that's a whole different ballgame. Because I would always get the mulch from them and put it on the yard, the gardens and everything. This is like leaf compost? Yes. Yeah. They, they take, pick up all the leaves, they mulch them, they keep them, and they have different piles. And every year there's a pile ready, and you go down and order a truckload, and they come and dump it. So, you get, But you missed out this year. Uh, three, <laughs> several years ago, I think three years ago, uh, four years ago, it was a wake-up call. Because then, you know, you could, huh. everybody was growing something. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Is there, is there more uh, just community or connecting happening around gardening that you're aware of or part of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think there is. I, um, the couple, a couple of houses down, um, there are people that I always talk to about the squirrels, and she went online on the listserv and bought a cage that had real thick chicken wire, and she showed it to me because she was growing her vegetables in there and the squirrels couldn't get in. So that was, when I saw that, that's what I wanted to do. But there's that kind of interchange that goes on, you know, mm -hmm. what you grow and how's it doing, mm -hmm. you know. She'll grow something, she'll, she'll have some shrubs that the guy up here has, so she'll bring little ones up to him to help him. Mm -hmm. now, there's that kind of interaction that goes on a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, Oh, what else? I mean, what else? Is there some part of your life here in D.C. that we haven't talked about? Or? No, I think you... <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you have for gardeners in D.C. or Tacoma for being an urban food grower? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of the community gardens because you share. You share stories, you share all kinds of things. I have a very good friend in D.C. who's, who, who, who's the landscape architect who, who has a community garden that she grows things in. Which, do you know which garden? I don't. She lives near the cathedral. Okay. But I don't know. There's where. an old one up, up that way, off yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. Down there, yeah. Um, and she's very much into gardening because she was talking to me about getting seed tapes for carrots because the seeds are so small. Mm -hmm. You can get them and plant them so that they you don't waste the seed and there's space so that they come up and they I said I never seen that well she said you have to go online and look <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I don't know I think you know just to enjoy it and I I think one of the things that I'm struck by when I drive by community gardens is that there's a respect for the food it doesn't look like people are stealing it or mm. one year somebody came in and stripped my whole garden. Really? Yeah, but it's only been one year. Everything? Everything. They came in and wow. they took everything. They took everything. And that's... I figured they needed it better than I did. Yeah. But that, I guess that's what I see more is the respect and, you know, that you, you know, that 
people don't take the food, they respect the fact you're growing it, they honor that. You know, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that about it. Hmm. Hmm. Did you ever, in you know, you refer to knowing, knowing just more of the science of yeah. food and what happens to food when it's processed. Did you ever act as more of an activist or advocate around issues like that? No, I was too busy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, running a household and a career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad there are people who are. Yeah. yeah. Well, now it's all. Yeah. People are much more aware of it yeah. in general. Um, and what about, I mean, in terms of you, you're part of a generation that whose parents maybe made a choice to let go of some of the old domestic right. ways, which you talked about, right. your, your parents and your grandmother's right. choice. What do you think about that now? I mean, has some of that knowledge been loss? I mean, where do you yeah. see all that headed? I, I, to, to me, I very much miss, you know, not having those experiences. And I've, to, to the most part, I've taught myself or I've found a way to be taught. Mm -hmm. um, the, and I can can and I knit and I, but I feel that people need to be more self-sufficient. I feel that there's a generation of young, entitled kids that figure if they put their hand out, they get what they want, and I hate it because I feel if you can't take, if you can't be self-sufficient, if you know that if push comes to shove, you can take care of yourself, you know you've lost a lot. I mean, my my parents, I knew growing up, they I could feel, you know, they would do whatever they needed to do to survive. Yeah, and I think. This generation doesn't have that. They don't know, like I said, how to sew on a button. Or they don't. It's not right. I feel that they should know that. And I think that, to to some extent, some of the schools are focusing more on that. Um, I know when my daughter studied biology, for the year they came in the biology lab and there was a dead man on the floor. And they spent the year figuring out what killed him and how and so there was a focus to what they were learning that had an application mm -hmm. and I think that there needs to be much more of that going on that you have an awareness of what you need to do how you preserve certain things you know what the responsibility and I find my kids will say to me well how, how do you know that we were talking about some store selling things really cheap and I said well that's a lost leader they're getting you in so that they oh we were talking about Whole Foods having a sale on Fridays and I said well they have a lost leader they sell something cheap they get you in there knowing you're going to buy other things my son said where'd you learn that and I said well it's marketing well where'd you learn that I said I guess I read it mm -hmm. but what it said to me is they're not as they're not as broad in investigating things. They're more focused on if they need to know, they go on the net, they hit something and get the answer. And I don't like that. I feel mm -hmm. I feel there needs to be more of a sense of, you know, understanding how things work and what happens when they don't work and what you do and what you can't do. And mm -hmm. So I figure they need to learn it. Yeah. Well, you're, I mean, your professional work is around yeah. Child development? Well, I I do both. I, I work with adults and with children. Okay. But um, knowing child development, knowing how children develop has very much helped me understand psychologically what goes on when there are glitches, both in children and adults. And developmentally, we're hardwired for things to happen, and if they don't, you just wait until they do or they don't happen at all. So if there's no early attachment, you know, there are grown-ups who are not attached, who can't attach to other people. I mean, it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel that knowing about child development made it much easier to really raise kids. You knew it. You know, I wasn't a helicopter parent. You know, you, you watch, they blossom, you know, you let them be who, who they, are, they are. But Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, anything else we should get speak to in this conversation? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. We've covered a lot. Well, thank you so much for well, sitting and talking. Yeah. Yeah.